Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. Today is Tuesday, October 27, 2015. This week, in a Nuclear Hot Seat special, we focus on the unfolding nuclear nightmare in North St. Louis, where a landfill fire is threatening a dump site of nuclear weapons waste left over from the 1940s Manhattan Project. 40,000 pounds of highly radioactive materials created during the building of the first atomic bombs lies buried at Westlake Landfill in unlined trenches. For years, this radioactive waste has been leaching into groundwater and contaminating the local area. Now, an underground fire at the adjacent Bridgeton Landfill, which has been burning since December of 2010, is reportedly less than a quarter of a mile, less than the length of three football fields away from this waste, and estimated to intersect with it in as little as three to six months. In this program, we'll gain medical insights into what the residents face from Dr. Helen Caldicott and hear a passionate on-the-site report from Don Chapman, who admins the Facebook Westlake Landfill page. But first, we hear the historic perspective from Bob Alvarez, who served as Senior Policy Advisor to the Energy Department's Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment from 1993 to 1999. He is now a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies and wrote the landmark November 2013 report, The Westlake Landfill, A Radioactive Legacy of the Nuclear Arms Race. Bob Alvarez, give us a sense of the history of the Westlake site and what we know about what is buried there. The West Lake site is sort of one of several areas that were radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project was stored and or disposed. And these are wastes that were generated from the 1940s through the 1950s at the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, which operated in downtown St. Louis. And beginning in 1944, Mellencroft began to process ore from a mine in the what was then known as the Belgian Congo in the Katanga province, known as the Shinkolabwe mine. And the uranium from this mine was extremely rich, and it was actually described as a, quote, freak occurrence of nature, unquote, by a top official of the early nuclear weapons program. The mine yielded the highest concentration of uranium of any mine found in the world since that time, somewhere between 30 to 70 percent. And the St. Louis plant processed this uranium for use in, in the reactors that were used to make the first batches of plutonium for the Manhattan Project and the U.S. nuclear weapons program. And in processing that uranium, they generated a lot of waste that came out of the processing. And eventually they ran out of room, and they started to store it in the open air in piles at the St. Louis airport at Lambert Field. They basically piled up about 133,000 tons of these processed waste residues and scrap at the airport site. And some of this material was extremely radioactive. When you uh, process uranium, especially from rich ore deposits from the Belgian Congo, your object is to remove as much uranium as possible to use it to make fuel and reactors. And that leaves behind the radium decay products, which in effect become much more highly concentrated. And these are much more toxic than uranium. It's isotopes like uh, radium-226 and thorium-230. So this waste is actually much, much more radioactive than it was when it was in the form of ore. And so this waste was sort of just sitting in piles out at the St. Louis airport, and some of it was shipped to other sites, uh, the Fernald Uranium Processing Plant in Ohio, the Ontario Ordnance Works in New York State, and it just sat around. And uh, eventually, the Atomic Energy Commission, which owned these waste products, sold what was left 
uh, at the airport, about 116,000 tons, to a private company, and they then proceeded to move it and put it in open piles in an area nearby in Hazelwood, Missouri. And some of these waste materials were then moved up to uh, Colorado, where there was a uranium mill, and they were trying to, they were seeking to extract other metals like vanadium and copper and nickel. But there was about 8,000, 10,000 tons of waste left over at this Hazelwood site. It was actually the worst in terms of worker exposure, in terms of the radiation it was giving off. And so they, the company, Potter and B&K Construction Company, basically just drove this out to the municipal landfill and dumped it there with about uh, 39,000 tons of highly contaminated topsoil on it. This was basically an illegal act. It happened in 1973, in July and August of 1973. And basically, nobody did anything about it until the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported on it and embarrassed the Atomic Energy Commission. They had to send an investigation. They conceded that, yes, the company that bought this stuff broke their rules, but they didn't do anything about it other than sort of send letters back and forth to the company. But in the meantime... The wastes were basically sitting in the landfill pretty much unattended. And eventually, when the Atomic Energy Commission was abolished in 1974-75, which created the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and now what we call the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had authority over this and began to study what had been dumped. And they did several surveys, and by 1988, the staff generated a report that said the wastes that are in this landfill are extraordinarily radioactive and that the actual the radioactive wastes can become even more radioactive over time because of the radium buildup or radium ingrowth occurring because of radium's apparent isotope is thorium-230, and it had a very large concentration of that. So when that decayed, it creates more radium, and that radium in turn is even more radioactive. So they recommend, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recommended taking steps to get that waste out of there. But nothing really happened. There was no action taken by the commission, and eventually the commission more or less gave up on it and terminated the license which allowed them to regulate this problem, and it automatically shifted to the Environmental Protection Agency, where the the EPA Superfund program took it over. And EPA's Superfund program is pretty much broke in terms of both finances and its ability to get things to happen anymore. It's been starved to death by the Congress. It's under a lot of pressure by lawsuits from private parties who don't want to except the remedies that the EPA takes. So the EPA looked at this, and they pretty much had made up their mind somewhere around eight years before that they issued a record of decision in 2008 that they would just leave the waste there and and put a cap on it and subject it to institutional controls. This landfill has these highly radioactive wastes that are, you know, contain more radium and thorium-230 than a typical uranium mill tailing operation, uh, uncovered mill tail, uranium mill tail operation. And it's, it's located in the midst of a fairly highly populated area in the suburb of North St. Louis County. It's about a mile away from the Missouri River, and it's on a floodplain. And this particular landfill would not meet any requirements or violate all requirements for the licensing of a radioactive disposal site. But there's just paralysis that's set in, and the EPA, even though they issued a record of decision now going on eight years ago, really hasn't done much about it. And so at the same time, there's a subsurface fire that's broken out at an area nearby the landfill in an adjacent landfill that's causing a lot of anxiety. What do we know about the radionuclides involved in addition to thorium, radium, and uranium? And when you say 40,000 pounds, can you give us a sense of exactly how big that is and how important it is. Because I've read that it contains more radiation than was released at Chernobyl or the fire from Fukushima. Well, I don't think that's correct. Uh, and it's a different type of radioactivity. It's basically 
uranium that has been built up in nature that's been greatly enhanced by industrial processes. So it's not anywhere not like uh, it doesn't contain fission products, for example. Fission products are radioactive isotopes that are created when you split the atom of uranium in a reactor. This does not have any of those kinds of wastes. And these wastes, I don't, I don't think it's a, a good idea to compare this to Chernobyl or Fukushima. Now, having said that, these wastes are quite hazardous because even even though they were naturally occurring, they still are, they're very highly concentrated. And they mostly give off a form of radiation called alpha radiation. And this is a kind of uh, radiation, especially if you inhale it or ingest it, is roughly about 20 times more potent a carcinogen than, let's say, x-rays. And so it's a dangerous material, and it shouldn't be there. About 80% of the radioactivity that they measured in the soil there is thorium-230, and this is considered one of the more, uh, it's, it's comparable to plutonium in terms of its radiotoxicity. And so it doesn't have a lot of the uh, mixture of radioactive isotopes that would be created in a reactor, so it's not really a fair comparison. The landfill is about 200 acres. It's about 16 miles northwest of downtown St. Louis. The area, the landfill that has the radioactive material from the Mallinckrodt plant is about 15 acres in two areas, and the contamination is about 65 feet deep in some areas. And what's going on is a slow sort of movement and flushing of these wastes out into the uh, nearby environment. It's not happening in huge quantities, but it's happening slowly and surely, and over time it will build up and then eventually become quite dangerous. From your perspective, what, if anything, can be done to mitigate this situation? Well, I think that right now there's just administrative paralysis going on. The EPA is not taking any, any immediate action. These are wastes that are generated really to make nuclear weapons, and even though they were sold to a private party, the government still has ultimate responsibility because they were the ones that originally generated this. And I think this is something that should be taken over by the federal nuclear program. There should be major efforts to try to remove as much of this from the environment where it is right now and probably contain it in the surface until you can figure out what to do with it next. And if you and your family lived in that area adjacent to or within a few miles of Westlake, what actions would you be taking now? Well, I mean, it's very hard to be an ordinary person living near a landfill like this because, first of all, when you moved there, you didn't know anything about it. The authorities that have control over that have really not done their job. And people have sort of limited options they can do. I mean, they can petition the governor, or they can petition the federal government, and there's been quite a bit of public opposition to what's been going on here. And it's slowly having an effect. But it really is going to depend on, ultimately depend on the congressional delegation, the governor, and others saying enough is enough, and we have to take action, and this is going to require federal monies. If you were in the immediate area, Would you stay or would you go? Well, what I know right now, I would not live there. But, you know, that's because I've been around this stuff for a long time. And But, you know, having said that, people don't necessarily have the options that I would have. A lot of people have their roots there. They can't afford to leave and pull up. They have families. So I think you need to be mindful of that. It's not the kind of danger – I mean – There are certain areas that have been contaminated by these wastes, and they're now discovering that the areas have been enlarged by the runoff and the natural processes that have spread the waste around in communities nearby. And so you can choose to move. I personally would not be living there, but, you know, I'm not in a position to tell other people what they should be doing or shouldn't be doing in this regard. I grew up in a highly polluted environment in Youngstown, Ohio where when I was a small child, people were dropping dead in the streets because of the air pollution. And this was a source of income for many people. And you just can't say, okay, time to leave, go find something else to do. 
it's a very difficult situation, but it does require, I think, much more attention and action by the responsible parties, especially the federal government, really needs to intervene and try to fix this problem as soon as possible. That was Bob Alvarez, Senior Scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. We will have a link up to his report on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 227. And yes, that's right. The Nuclear Hot Seat website is now back up and better than ever. Huzzah! Many of you had a part in making this happen through your generous contributions, and I am grateful to all of you. However, Nuclear Hot Seat still has monthly operating expenses, so donations are always needed and welcomed. To donate, go to our website. I love being able to say that again. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. It provides a secure link for you to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer not to donate online, email me for a snail mail address where you can send your donation. Whatever you can do to help with our ongoing expenses, thank you. For the medical perspectives on problems faced by the people living near the Westlake landfill, I spoke with Dr. Helen Caldicott arguably the single most articulate and passionate advocate of citizen action to remedy the nuclear and environmental crises in the world. A medical doctor and former instructor in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, she co-founded Physicians for Social Responsibility, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, and was herself nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. She joined us via Skype from her home in Australia. To a conference call with the mothers and certain others, well, I asked them lots of questions, and from a medical perspective, I made a few statements, and they've been sending me information since that time, and now I've been invited to a symposium to be held in February in that area to discuss this issue in public meetings and I think with the media. To go into what the dangers are that are faced, in his 2013 report on the site for the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., Bob Alvarez listed the radioactive contaminants on the site as about 80% thorium-230, which has a half-life of over 77,000 years and is about 60,000 times more radioactive than uranium. The remaining contamination is from isotopes of radium, uranium, actinium, and proactinium. What dangers to health have the people living nearby been facing all these years from the thorium-230 and these other radionuclides that are just and have been just sitting there? Well, it's quite extraordinary, really. I mean, they, they imported the richest uranium in the world from the Congo during the Manhattan Project so that it would be much easier to make bombs from the uranium, which was very, very rich. And that's that's unusual to find such a rich grade of uranium. Hence, the byproducts of that enrichment to produce uranium to the tune of, I don't know, about 80% enrichment are extremely radioactive, as Bob Alvarez says. Thorium decays to radium-226. Now, radium-226, and it consistently decays all the time, radium-226 is an alpha emitter, means tiny particles emitted from the atom. It doesn't damage you unless it's inside you, so that if you eat food contaminated with radium, and radium is very uh, soluble, it concentrates in the food chain, and you can't taste the radium, and radium is a calcium mimicker. In other words, it goes to bone and teeth. In the past, Madame Curie enriched radium from pitch blend or isolated it, and she she died of what's called aposcanemia. Her bones were so radioactive, all the blood cells, white, red, and platelets, died, and so she couldn't produce any more blood cells. She was so radioactive, they virtually had to bury her in a sort of radioactive safe coffin. Her daughter also died of leukemia, so we've known forever that radium is terribly toxic. So radium is a daughter of thorium, and there's a lot of radium in that area. It's very soluble, and and it has been seeping into the water supplies in Cold Creek and 
radioactive elements have been found in trees adjacent or close to the site and also in soil, and I'm sure it's concentrating in people's food. Then the other elements are radon gas, which is also a daughter of uranium. Uranium decays through a series of, of radioactive elements, and they're called daughters, not sons, and radon is a gas. And when you inhale radon, it's a potent cause of lung cancer. In fact, it's seen now by your official officialdom, it's one of the main causes of cancer in the population. And so radon gas le- seeps out almost certainly of those waste dumps and has been doing so ever since they've been there. All of these daughters of uranium, of which there are many, and uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, so it's there forever, are incredibly toxic. And it just staggers me as a physician why this has been allowed to happen, why it's been passed on from private contractor to private contractor, why any private contractors in the first place would have wanted to buy this material, which is just extremely dangerous, and why the federal government hasn't done a thing about it. So the people living near this radioactive waste dump, and it's a very large area, are suffering the effects of the Cold War, and they're dying as a result. And I don't think there have been any decent studies done medically, but I do know that there have been 45 cases of appendiceal cancer. Cancer of the appendix is, is, I mean, I've never heard of it in my whole medical career. It's as rare as we say in Australia as hen's teeth, because hens have no teeth. And there are many other cancers that are arising. I don't know of a a decent medical study to document this, which has been reported in the peer-reviewed literature. But it's clear that people are getting sick and dying from this dreadful situation, and it's up to the federal government right now. And there should be no argument between the EPA and, uh, I don't know, the military about who should clean it up, a directive must come from the White House now to move in and clean it immediately because there is a fire in a garbage dump adjacent 300 feet or so from this radioactive waste dump. How might this health danger change or shift or magnify when the fire at the adjacent Bridgeton landfill, which is now the equivalent of less than three football fields in length away from the nuclear waste, how might the health danger change for the people who live in the area? Well, you know, none of us really know the answer to that question, except that it's probable that the fire will get into the radioactive waste dump, and when radiation radioactive waste gets hot, of course, more radon gas will be released and more radioactive elements into the air. God knows what will happen, but the county is preparing emergency evacuation procedures, but, you know, you'd have to evacuate huge areas. It depends upon how hot the fire is, what the plumes of radiation are, what the wind direction is, how far it blows, the concentration of the radiation in the plume. So, who knows? I mean, it's sort of like a, if you will, a sort of a slow meltdown. On September 3rd, Missouri Attorney General Chris Coster released a strongly worded statement that at first included new expert reports that concluded that radiation and other pollutants had migrated off the site at Bridgeton Westlake, and he cited multiple experts and reports. Yet, just today, Sunday, October 25th, Attorney General Coster issued a statement citing EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, insurances that, and here I quote, it is a relief to learn that EPA studies do not show an immediate danger to the general public. And he seems to be backpedaling from his previous position. Now, in that's that... A lot. That's a lie. Tell us why. Well, the EPA already said that the contaminants of migration from off-site... No immediate danger. What, what, do, what do they mean? I mean, if a child eats an apple or some spinach with some radium in it, it takes a while to get the cancer. <laughs> so I suppose they're, they're mucking around with the latent period of carcinogenesis, the incubation time for cancer, which is any time from 5 to 80 years. So I suppose they say, well, there's no immediate danger. People are not going to drop dead from cancer now. But in fact, people are getting cancer and some are dropping dead. 
So they're mucking around with English language, so to speak, and definitions by in so doing not telling the truth. Other than cancer, what are the other possible compromises to health that can take place from these exposures? Oh, I think it's, mo it's mostly cancer we're dealing with, but also if radium gets into a developing embryo in the first three months of intrauterine life, the embryo develops all its organs and arms and legs in that time, and after that it only grows in size for the next six months. So if some radium, for instance, gets into a developing embryo, embryo it can cause severe congenital abnormalities as happened with mothers who took the drug thalidomide for morning sickness and their babies were born without arms or legs or the like. So certainly it could be impacting embryos. The other thing it can be doing is changing genes in the eggs and sperm of the surrounding population, be it children or adults. And mutations can occur in the genes of the eggs and sperm to induce genetic disease generations hence. And there are now 2,600 genetic diseases described my specialty is cystic fibrosis, the most common genetic disease of childhood. One in 25 Caucasians carry that gene. And radiation induces genetic mutations, all of which, or almost which, are deleterious and cause disease. We're not talking about immediate disease, except if the mutation is dominant, which could cause, I mean, dwarfism, and there are quite a few dominant mutations, which will arise in the next generation, but most mutations are recessive and they don't express themselves unless two recessive genes get together like blue eyes or two genes for cystic fibrosis or two genes for hemochromatosis. That's a long-term major health problem. So we're dealing... <laughs> this is what the nuclear age means, Libby. This is what the nuclear age means. And most people don't understand, but I can tell you that the nuclear industry understands and hides behind lies. With your plans to go to North St. Louis early next year, what do you envision yourself doing and what do you hope to accomplish? All I'll do is I'll have a blackboard and a piece of chalk or a whiteboard and I will teach people what radiation does and what the various elements are in the radioactive waste dump and what uranium is and the various forms of radiation, be it gamma like x-rays, which is being emitted from that dump, or alpha or beta radiation and what that means, how it damages cells, how it can mutate a, a gene in a cell called the regulatory gene and the cell will sit dormant for any time from 5 to 80 years in one day instead of dividing into two by mitosis in a regulated way. It produces trillions of cells and that's a cancer. I'll teach them that it takes a single alpha particle to hit a single gene in a single cell to induce cancer and kill you. I just want to teach people basic radiation biology and what these various elements are and how they concentrate in the food chain and get into the air and the like so people can be well educated and decide what they're going to do about it. If you lived in proximity to the Westlake landfill, what would you be doing right now? Well, I wouldn't live there. But if you did find yourself having purchased a home and having built your life... I would move. I would move. But, well, if I was an old person, I wouldn't move. As my daughter, who's a doctor, said, Mum, don't worry about radiation. You're too old to get your cancer anyway. <laughs> I'm 77. But if I had children, I'd get out of there immediately. I'd flee. And is there any other advice that you want to give? And people? also, I, yes, the, the advice I would give is that people who need to move, and I think the whole area should be evacuated, because as they clean it, they're going to have to clean up that waste. I have, God knows where they're going to put it. God knows. And into what containers, I have no idea. But as they clean it up, it's going to become more and more and more dangerous. And the government needs to pay to relocate those people into decent living situations well away from that area so that they're living in a relatively safe environment. The government must do that. The government already spends over $1 trillion on the Pentagon building weapons to kill people all over the world and maintain and build new nuclear weapons. Well, it's time they stopped that and it's time they spent that money transferred from the Pentagon, from Lockheed Martin and Boeing and, and Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics and the like to the people of America particularly those now
who are still suffering the effects of the Cold War. If you had any final thoughts to pass on directly to the people who live in the Westlake area about their personal response, their political response to this or anything else, what would that be? My advice would be to educate yourselves. I suppose I'd say buy my book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, and you will see there the dangers of living near uranium tailings, which is what they're living next to, only, only they're much more potent than normal uranium tailings, as I described previously in this interview. Educate yourselves, and just remember what your great President Jefferson once said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. Then rise up and take control of this. I mean, take over your state house, do whatever is necessary to make and force the federal government to spend the money to relocate you and clean up this terrible mess. Dr. Helen Caldicott. Dawn Chapman is a self-described mom fighting for the safety of my family and my community. She is admin for the Westlake Landfill Facebook page, which is ground zero for information about the issues. We spoke on Friday, October 23rd. Dawn, give people, first of all, an idea of where you live in proximity to the Westlake Landfill. I am about a little less than two miles south of the landfill. It more or less feels as though it's in my backyard, too close for comfort. When and how did you become aware of the material that was buried there? I had become aware of the Manhattan Project waste in this landfill about two and a half years ago. After I called the state agency, I had smelled these terrible odors, and we had no idea what they were. So when I called the state agency, they explained there was a landfill on fire and that that landfill also housed the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste from the Manhattan Project, and I was just stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I had no idea why there would be Manhattan Project waste even in St. Louis. Besides the fact that it was from the Manhattan Project, I was shocked by that. What I couldn't understand is how I was allowed to buy a home within two miles of the site, and nobody told me about it. When we bought our house, we had a disclosure form. You know, it didn't have lead paint. It didn't have this. It didn't have that. What I don't understand is why I can buy a house next to radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project, and nobody has to disclose that when you're purchasing a home. Nobody has to tell you about that. It seemed completely unfair, and to be honest, it kind of shattered my little world. How long have you lived in that house? I have been in this house for about ten and a half years now. I was pregnant with my first child when I moved into this house, and this is the house that I chose, that my husband and I chose to raise our family in. What impact, if any, do you believe that the radioactive materials in the landfill have already had on you and your family? You know, I don't know. I obviously don't have any proof, but I do have three children with special needs. My husband has an autoimmune illness. I am all right right now, but unfortunately when you've been exposed to this and allowed to live next to it, you never know if you've survived it or not. You never know if you came out unscathed because I don't know that I'm not going to wake up next week with a lump somewhere. You know, unfortunately that story is playing out with all my neighbors and the people that live around this area as well as the people that live in other areas in St. Louis, that this radioactive waste has been allowed to sit out within their communities. What moved you to decide to start the Facebook page, Westlake Landfill? The Westlake Landfill Facebook page was started by my friend who lives around the corner, Karen Nickel. We did not know each other. The media pointed out the page, and there weren't very many people on it, and so I met Karen Nickel, and I became an admin. You know, Karen Nickel grew up around this waste, played in parks in North County that they're now finding radioactive waste in, and she's very ill, and both of us were just so furious is the word that comes to mind that this has been allowed to happen in this entire area and that nobody knows about it. Nobody knows that we have Manhattan Project waste from the bomb in creeks, in backyards, in parks, 
in landfills. It's been sitting on the surface of this landfill for over 42 years. It is one of the best kept secrets still in St. Louis. You have had impact or believe that there has been impact just based upon the waste being there and migrating into the streams, the backyards, as you just said. What difference has been made in your consciousness with what looked like the incremental encroachment on this waste of the fire at the neighboring Bridgeton landfill? So now you're going to get me emotional. I'm going to start to cry here in a minute. You know, nobody that comes in contact with this waste, not the workers, not the victims of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, not the people who lived around it, grew up around it in North County, nobody that encounters this waste anywhere gets away from it and doesn't have consequences. It's unique. It touches people. It may be it's cancer. Maybe it's autoimmune. Maybe it shows up in a birth defect in their child. This fire spread the awareness to some extent, because we could smell something that otherwise is invisible. Because you can't smell radiation, you can't see it. But the fire, even if it's not coming out in the fire, just because people can smell it, they're aware of how far particles travel from a site. And they know that there's this invisible giant sitting up there now. They know that that's what this radioactive waste is, and it's sitting on the surface. So for them, and for me, every time somebody joins the page, every single time, if they're from St. Louis or they grew up here or they live at another site and they're asking for information and, of course, we give it, you have to remember what that does on an emotional level to us. We don't know these people, but when we have to break the news, they say, well, I grew up in this location, and I say, well, you're about a mile from this site. You grew up within a mile, or I played in this park. Well, did you know that that park's currently being remediated? I mean, I don't think people understand how heartbreaking that is for Karen and myself on this page. We are delivering news to these people that they'll never be rid of it. These people will forever, in the back of their minds, wonder and think and know to some extent that they were exposed to this. And 10 years from now, even if they're okay now, 10 years from now, These people, they're going to wake up one morning and they have a lump or a bump, find cancer. They're always going to wonder if that caused it, and they're always going to be, so to speak, waiting for the other shoe to drop. I have great empathy with that, having been at Tree Mile Island and gone through, fortunately not cancer, but my own health issues and the own encroachment on my health through the years. Now, in a very short time, Your Facebook page, as of this morning, has grown to over 17,000 members, and I see it growing exponentially. When people post, what are the major concerns that they are seeking to get information on? Well, when people post on our Facebook page, a lot of them are asking, how far is the fire from the radioactive waste? Do we have an estimated timeline of when it will hit? And that's a question that I can't answer them. And unfortunately, when I try and I say, well, you know, we are trying to prevent that from happening, it doesn't relieve their panic because, and I think you will empathize with this, the mere fact that the government has let it sit out that long and has let it sit out in a creek and out in parks, the mere fact that the government let this sit out all over the place in St. Louis, you know, they're asking themselves, what makes this situation one that the government is suddenly going to swoop in and save the day? It is the fear of the fire hitting the radioactive waste or the waste hitting the fire, but the hopelessness that you see on the page today is because they believe that they live within a broken system and they have a broken government and they have elected officials who didn't care enough to tell them that it was there in the first place. They don't have faith that they're going to step in and do the right thing now that it's threatened by this fire. And that is something that I don't have an answer for. You know, people say, well, they're panicking because of the three to six months. No, they're not. They're panicking because they cannot wrap their heads around who in their right mind would think it okay to leave it out in the middle of a community like this. And the fact that they did so knowingly, they don't have the faith that their government will step up and do the right thing. One thing that was extraordinary in St. Louis is that honest information was sent out 
to the people so that you could at least know what was going on and take action on it. Specifically, I'm talking about the preparedness plan and also statements that came from the Attorney General's office. Has there been any backpedaling that has been forced on either the emergency preparedness information or the Attorney General's stance? We have the support of our local first responders. These are the people that you trust when you have to call 911 if you have a fire at your house. These are the people who have our backs on a ground level. The bad peddling has come from the company who's responsible for spending the money to clean up the radioactive waste and to deal with the fire. The elected officials haven't backpedaled that we've seen. I did have a conversation with one of them today, and my response to all the elected officials is this. They're going to want to try and and throw science. Where is the fire? Is the fire close? Is it far? My response is, who cares? Why is there a fire up there in the first place? And why would you let radioactive waste sit on the surface of a landfill and expose it to any number of risks? So this isn't a situation I think that they can backpedal on. I think if they did, it's going to cost them politically. Where is Governor Jay Nixon in all of this? I know that he has made statements in the past committing Missouri to having more nuclear power, saying that it holds real promise. What has been his response to date to this upswell of attention on the landfill, the radioactive material, and the encroaching fire? This community has heard no response from their governor, Governor Jay Nixon. We haven't heard a single word from him, not a we're concerned and I'm very sorry this is happening to the citizens of Missouri, not even so much as that. And it's very disappointing because I get that he may not have a magical fix for this site, but he can at least acknowledge the pain and suffering that this site is causing the citizens of his state of Missouri. And he can acknowledge the legacy that has been allowed from the Manhattan Project and from this nuclear waste to sit and contaminate all over St. Louis County and North County in his state. And that is the very least that he should be doing right now. And we're not hearing that. The EPA has finally showed up and moved in. This is more than two years after the report came out that Bob Alvarez wrote about what was actually in the landfill. Now suddenly that it's hit the news, the EPA has moved in. And what I thought is that they're trying to say that there is no danger from possible radiation release and that the fire is moving in another direction, which to me sounds like the dog ate my homework. How are their statements being received, and what, if any, reassurance has resulted in the local population? You know, EPA statements are not being received well, and what I mean by that is, as an agency, they are blowing every ounce of credibility that they ever could have had with this community. And I say that because you're right. They are coming in and they are trying to characterize this waste and figure out how much radioactive waste, what kind is it, They've had this site for over 20 years, and they have done none of that, even though we have been begging. And the real failure comes, you cannot ever call a site safe, and you cannot have a TSDR writer report saying a site is safe using 10-year-old data. You can't say that and then in the next sentence turn around and say, we're currently testing to try and characterize where the waste is and what it is. If you don't know where it is and what it is and how much of it you have, then you don't know anything about this site. So you have no business telling people it's safe. The second thing is, and I think you guys are probably watching it, there's this great report that just came out from the World Health Organization on exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation. Exposure at low levels to ionizing radiation significantly increases the risk of cancer and other illnesses. The levels that EPA is using to state or safe at this landfill are based on acute exposure levels for nuclear workers and Hiroshima and Nagasaki victims. They are not using these remediation levels to even think about chronic exposure. The mainstream media has finally been taking note of what's going on at Westlake. Looking at the media coverage, how has it been? Has there been extensive
extensive coverage in the St. Louis area. And do you feel that the community has been served by media coverage in any important way? You know, that's a twofold question. Any media coverage for us spreads the word because we are just moms. And it's difficult. All we have is a Facebook page. I can't spend a lot of money on billboards. So any media coverage helps spread the word. However, there's a lot of really ugly politics behind radioactive waste right now in the state of Missouri. Local media is very much influenced. And so we've learned that there are people that are sensitive and they acknowledge what we're going through. And there are also media who are on the side of the big corporations. So we've had to learn who is who. And it's very frustrating. A lot of times our words get spun. There are some great, great journalists out here in St. Louis and some wonderful media that just understand this issue and think it's horrible, and they do their best to report on it. But then when it hits the producer, it gets edited and changed. And it's very frustrating for them as journalists. They want to remain as unbiased as they can, but during the editing phase is where a lot of that stuff happens. And it's very unfortunate. You know, we have good media days and we have bad media days. Knowing what you do about what's going on, what plans have you made or been able to make for yourself and your family? Boy, that's a great question. I'll be honest with you, I have not been able, it has been so busy the past week and a half that I haven't been able to put a detailed plan in place for my family. I've been trying to help everybody else with theirs for their family. But in the back of my head, I know two things. I will never let my children be here when their fire hits that waste. That there will never come a time when you can ever convince me that it is perfectly safe for a fire to hit the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste and for that not to be an enormous problem. So I will not be here and my family will not be here when and if that is allowed to happen. The second thing is I'm in a unique situation from my house. I don't want to live here anymore. If I'd have known this, I never would have chosen this home. This is not where I would have chosen to raise my children. But that being said, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're not a tree. Get up and move. Listen, I am not ever going to put another family in the situation that I'm in right now. I am not going to put my house up for sale and sit across from somebody during the closing and hand the keys to my house over to another family with children and let them come in to this situation that I'm in. I, I refuse to do that. I also refuse to be that person that buries their head and doesn't tell others. I would have appreciated a knock on my door knowing about this site when I went to buy this house. Somebody should have told me. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, whether they think this is serious, whether they're not worried about it, that's up to them, but everybody has the right to know. In hindsight, there may be no place on this planet safe enough for it, but it sure as heck doesn't belong in people's backyards, in parks, are sitting on the surface of landfills next to schools. That is something that this community needs to come together and make the elected officials understand that the citizens of St. Louis are no longer going to tolerate radioactive waste sitting in their parks and in their backyards and in their creeks and sitting on the surface of landfills. It is no longer going to be tolerated. And this is a decades-long legacy problem from the bomb that was back in the 1940s and 50s that started here. We opened a chapter of St. Louis on the Manhattan Project, and I believe that it's going to be up to this community in St. Louis to close that chapter. We need to start being proactive, and we need to be the model for other states where this is occurring. These legacy sites absolutely have to be cleaned up. Is there anything you would like to say directly to those individuals either living in proximity to Westlake or who once upon a time did live in proximity to Westlake who are listening to this call now? Now you're really going to make me cry. I'm very sorry that nobody told you. I am sorry. I, I It's not my place to apologize, but somebody owes you an apology, and I don't know who that is. 
but somebody owes you an apology for letting you live somewhere and letting this be sitting out and for you not knowing about it. I am trying as a mom, my heart goes out to you, whether you're a mom, a dad, a grandma, aunt or uncle, or a good neighbor, we all wish well for others, and we all wish that they would live in a safe area, and I just don't believe that this is one of them. I would like your help. As hopeless and as upsetting as it is, there's always hope. And there is such a large following of people that are aware of this issue. And with this broadcast, I hope we get more. We all need to band together, and we need to make them fix this. Everybody hearing this now knows about it, and they can't say that they don't. And so you are now part of the legacy of the Manhattan Project because you know about it, because you're listening and you're hearing this. And it is up to you to be part of the solution Because if you walk away from hearing this and you do nothing, you are putting yourself in a position where you're part of the problem. You move me to tears as well. If there is an action that can be taken by the national and international listening audience of Nuclear Hot Seat, we are listened to in 58 countries on six continents in the course of any given month. What can we do? to best support you now. I need you to call the two senators from the state of Missouri, that is Senator Roy Blunt and Senator Claire McCaskill. I need you to call the Department of Energy, and I need you to call the White House. Your message to all these people needs to be the same. We, as America, do not leave our soldiers behind. This is waste from World War II. This is the Manhattan Project waste. And these people that are dying of cancer and these people that are getting sick and losing children, anybody that has been harmed by this or has lost a loved one or lost their life, these are all victims of World War II. And worse yet, it's occurring by friendly fire. It is time to end this legacy and clean this up. I am so sorry that you and all the others are living this nightmare. I'm just very appreciative that you guys are giving us a platform, and I feel like you guys understand what it is we're going through. And I want to thank you and others who have fought this issue before I even knew about it. Because you were fighting for my life and you didn't even know and neither did I. Dawn Chapman. The names and contact information on politicians and government agencies she's mentioned, as well as a link to the Facebook page, will be found on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 227. And we will continue to follow the Westlake Landfill nightmare in the coming weeks. For those of you concerned about best practices to help safeguard your health against radiation, check out the RAPT program, R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. It's a six-audio series that I put together with certified nutrition educator Kimberly Roberson, who is also the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. It is a six-audio program on ways to best help safeguard your health against radiation, and you can find it at RAPT, R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com, or search out RAPT on Facebook. Here's today's final thought. To the people whose lives are being directly impacted by the Westlake Nuclear Landfill, I am so sorry that you are going through this One of the major unacknowledged byproducts of nuclear technology is the emotional impact it inflicts on those subjected to its errors. Right now, each of you is probably feeling stunned, shocked, enraged, depressed, horrified, overwhelmed in grief, and or much more. You may be engaging in a variety of compulsive behaviors with food, alcohol, or your substance or behavior of choice. You may be frenetically busy or catatonic, may find yourselves weeping or screaming or going from one emotional extreme to another. I know, 
After Three Mile Island, I found myself doing all of these, and much worse. You are not experiencing post-traumatic stress because there's nothing post about this. You are still going through it. You are being stressed to the max every day. Realize that everyone around you is similarly fragile right now. So be gentle with yourself and kind to those around you. At core, you are facing one of two equally unacceptable decisions. Leave or stay. Whether you stay or whether you go, what will keep you sane is fighting back. Don't let the politicians, the government agencies, or the irresponsible companies think that they can continue to get away with their long-standing institutionalized nuclear incompetence. They are in collusion with each other to hide the ugly truth of endless contamination from unremediated radioactive waste. That's because the truth will cost them money, as though money is more important than your lives. Just because nuclear radioactivity is invisible doesn't mean that you should be. Take that emotional energy and protest, write, call, confront, make a noise, a big angry noise, and do not stop. Finally, Know that there is an international anti-nuclear movement that has your back. You are not alone. And you will never be alone with this again. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 27, 2015. My thanks for the help with this episode and the research to Kevin Camps, Patty Amino, Jan Budar, Debbie with an I, Mark Kronowitz, Joni Ray, Ms. Milky the Clown, and all of you from the Facebook Westlake Landfill page who have responded so generously to my questions and comments. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood, California. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and, as of this week, is now being carried on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, which was formerly the Veterans Truth Network. Welcome to Stu's nearly one million listeners. You picked a great week to join us. The archive of Nuclear Hot Seat is available on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby How Lady and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit, personal, and blog use, as long as proper attribution is provided. If you are with mainstream media, Please use this as source material, but give credit where it's due, or I'll have to charge you. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you yet again, be gentle with yourself, be kind to each other, and when in doubt, take a deep breath, and then another, and another. Because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep. Because we are all, we are really all, in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.